So thank you all, each and every one of you for being here today. It's such a such an exciting day to be able to connect you guys without even realizing that you know each other. <laughs> uh, such an incredible way that we're, we're just uh, seven degrees of separation, but truly for you guys, it seems like it's just one. <laughs> Um, so I'm really excited because I've been doing this virtual travel event art across America for a couple of months now and it's been such an incredible way to get to know um, our neighbors uh, across this, this big country and you we don't really realize who who and what people are doing in different parts of the world, especially in, in times of this pandemic where there's so much uncertainty and and but still life goes on right so it's it's beautiful that we're able to share it so. Art Across America is uh, traveling through different states and territories every week to learn about local arts and culture. So today we're going to be presenting Hawaii and it's introduced to you by BG Gallery and Soyo Magazine. So we bring to you individuals, artists like yourselves, and uh, we thank you for joining us. My name is Estefania. I'm currently based in Los Angeles and I'm an art consultant with BG Gallery with a focus on working with new collectors and entrepreneurs. Here at BG Gallery, we specialize in accomplished artists who have crossed traditional and contentious art ideologies. Our aim is to bring authentic art back to the forefront of the contemporary art scene. I'm also the founder of Soyo Magazine, an arts and culture magazine with, uh, which provides a platform for diverse creators to share their stories while focusing on a sustainable approach to selling art. So as many of you know, or have heard, soy yo means I am me in Spanish. So the best way that I love to uh, begin the conversation is just by allowing you to take a moment and uh, complete the phrase I am, because the mantra is that everything you say after I am, you become. So um, I'll, give you, I'll give you a moment and we'll start with Brooke, go to Solomon and then Marquez. Han Hanale. <laughs> I am a product of of Hawaii, of of my ancestors. Um, what I what I try to be, um, what I hope to be, what I teach my children someday to be, is to always recognize and honor them by how I, not so much by what I say but what I do in my actions. Mahalo. Okay. Oh, aloha. I am returning. Love it. Um, I guess I can say, oh, oh no, which in Hawaiian, means I am myself. I am me. Um, but I would also say uh, I am ancestor. Um, we all, we are, we are the living ancestor, the product of all of those that come, have come before us. We are the ancestors of the future. So we think about ourselves in a continuum. Wow, that I love that you're saying that because I think it goes in theme with um, how I approached you, Hanale, is talking about how there is an indigenous culture within every part of the world that we're going to. And I know that uh, for you, and when we briefly spoke, you had this beautiful connection to something that your ancestors did without even really realizing why there was an intrigue. Um, and Solomon, I think you also speak very much on kind of being this rebirth. I mean, hence the, the painting in the back <laughs> where, that you briefly told us about. So, um, I mean, all of you, I feel, really encompass that and are, are living your life to truthfully to wanting to be a good example for your ancestors and leave the good mark behind. Um, so I'll start with you, Hanale. Um, tell me about how you got into the fiber artwork and uh, how you felt like it was a part of your calling. So uh, growing up, I was surrounded by my many of the things that my great grandmother made. Uh, my Hawaiian great grandmother was a, a quilt maker. She was a hat, hat weaver, a mat maker. 
um, and and our, and our family had a number of those things and still do care for a number of those things. And I was fortunate enough to be raised around those things in the house. Uh, and those things actually inspired me to, to just um, think about how I can reconnect to those um, practices and traditions because no one in my family um, at that time anyway, um, still practiced those things. Um, and when I was able to take my first workshop um, during high school and I was able to learn some of those um, practices that my great grandmother did starting with weaving. And from there, it just opened up into all of the various forms that, um, that just gave me pride and into my, my heritage and just connecting to place. And I think that's where, you know, it, it has taken me, you know, through all of the, the various um, experiences in, uh, throughout the Pacific, throughout um, in the museum world, um, collections, just having conversations with different people. It really does um, just, again, support this idea of acknowledging all of those things that surround us, our environment, people, community, all of those things that inspire us and, and um, give us that thing, uh, that spark of energy for creativity and, and life. Um, and I think that's the, that's the foundation for what the, our ancestors um, hope to perpetuate um, in, our, in, our, um, in our generations to come. That's beautiful. I, I feel like Solomon, you would have a beautiful something to say to piggyback off that and maybe emphasize on on the painting behind you and tell us about that little rebirth. Oh, sure thing, sure thing. I, um, I'm uh, really ex honored and privileged to be able to come and share with you guys a little bit of uh, the work that I've been doing. Um, and I must say, the, with Brooke and Hanale here, I'm I'm somewhere in between the two of them, you know, in some of my aesthetic and style and some of the research that I've been doing. Um, I I grew up out in Waianae on the uh, west side of Oahu, and Waianae has the largest populations of Native Hawaiians in the state, um, and it uh, it needed to change its story because its story was all about how we were broken and how we lost and how we were. Um, uh, you know, vanquished, and we were actually, no, we're going to change all of those words. We became a thousand times stronger because of what happened. Yeah, what happened was something that allows us to transcend and, 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 be, and have empathy and sympathy and connectedness to all the other uh, overthrows that are happening right now in the world that, are, that allow us to have, um, it, it gave me this understanding that, you know, um, because what my parents were able to do, they took me up into the back of the mountains and um, with all the land being covered with like weeds and everything like that, we actually helped to open up all these ancient tarot patches that were underneath the, um, the, you know, the rubbish and the weeds. And we worked with people, you know, predominantly Native Hawaiian, you know, other Native Hawaiians who were, you know, recovering from substance abuse, you know, kids that were getting kicked out of every other program. And so what I witnessed as a, as a kid growing up was, you know, the story changing and the people changing their stories yeah, as, as they changed the land. And so all the while I was watching, you know, you know, watching like Hayao Miyazaki movies and stuff like that. And like, uh, you know, and I was like, okay, here's my cartoons and here's all this really cool, um, you know, you know, Hawaiian culture. And how can I fuse the two things together? How, how can I take what I witnessed as a child and universalize it and then be part of um, telling our stories around the world because there's just a tremendous amount of relevancy and universality and um, people being able to reboot their story and to um, and I think that uh, when you know so, so anyway so, so the work that I have behind me I, I, I could talk for absolutely forever so I'm gonna stop right now but the work that I have behind me is symbolic of this idea that I've been playing with of, human beings returning to haloa, returning to our plant forms. Because in Hawaiian, we came from the taro plant. So this idea of returning to the taro plant. And here we have these hybrid human uh, plants and there's actually blooming like flowers and there's like a whole other generations within that flower and they're all emerging. So anyway, um, this is a mural that I recently did and I could talk on and on about these ideas, but I'll, I'll hand it back to the, to the group. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, that's incredible. And I actually have a question to piggyback off that. You, you, There's a flower that it's suggesting that that's where the Hawaiian people come from. Um, the, the taro, the taro plant. Yeah, that's our, that's our, um, our staple crop. It's a, um, yeah, yeah. And so, but, but we come from a plant and we return to a plant and that's what I'm doing with my sci-fi and fantasy kind of ideas. Okay. Brooke, um, you also mentioned that your, your images, you kind of portray these, uh, anonymous characters in a sense, but with an idea that of a story that you're retelling that's been told to you through generations of, of your family. Mm -hmm. um, and then now you've noticed even that there's other people who've been able to connect with these images in different parts of the world and saying like, hey, that looks like someone I know. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, like uh, Hanalei and, and Solomon, I'm a product of my environment growing up. Yeah, uh, my dad, drove a cement truck, but he's, one of his hobbies was painting. He had a big Hawaiian library. He had a big art library. And so as long as I put the books back, I was okay. If I didn't, I would remember to put it back the next time, yeah? My dad raised six sons. He was 6'3", 280, yeah? You get the idea, yeah? Yeah. But anyway, um, he loved Hawaiian history, and that kind of rubbed off on me. And so I read that uh, Hawaiian historical book, Ruling Chiefs, by the time I was in uh, fifth grade. Uh, the stories inside there amazed me, but I was uh, a better learner if you show me a picture, a visual learner. And so I sketched and I, I did a lot of that as a small kid, bought a lot of comics to learn because my dad, like I said, one of his hobbies was art, but he was self-taught too. But he loved his Hawaiian culture and, and so did I. And then when I started painting full-time about 10 years ago, just started painting, um, I wanted to make these people come alive. In, in, in a picture where when they lived, they never even met Captain Cook, yeah? So we don't know how they look like, but I get help and that's, that's kind of what I wanted to share. I get help from the uh, Kupuna when I portray them. And I think that's pretty neat. Kupuna means ancestor? Yeah. Okay. Now um, I'll start with you too, Brooke. What do you feel your purpose is on the island as you're retelling these stories of, of who, where you come from and where your indigenous background comes from? Well, basically, um, I just want to share with the world um, what a unique and awesome culture that we have here. It, it's a culture of aloha, really. Aloha is colorblind, yeah? You can have that in China, Japan, it doesn't matter. It's, it's how you treat other people and it's how you portray them. But for example, uh, I went to my eye doctor. He's been in uh, Keomoku Street in downtown Honolulu for over 30 years. He didn't know who Keomoku was until I told him the other day. He had no idea who that was. I told him it was a famous chief and an uncle of Kamehameha. His daughter was a mover and shaker, Kahumano. Kamehameha is one of his favorite wives. And so he learned a little bit about that. But I think all of us, Solomon, Hanale, we all have different talents to show our love for the kopuna now. Hanale, he's a lucky bugger because he works at the museum. He get access to stuff that our ancestors actually touched and made, yeah? But when you see that, when you see the craftsmanship, so-called Stone Age people, you your love for them increases even more. And you wanna do your part today to help their name and memory continue with our small kids. Because sometimes everybody has a tendency, well, not everybody, but those who are oppressed has a tendency to play the victim and point fingers and not do anything about it, yeah? I get guys come in my booth all the time. I, I do paintings of the chiefs like that. This is Pete Ilani and his family at Iao. Oh, that's my ancestor, you know, we come from that royal line, blah, 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 big puffed out chest. I said, wonderful, bro. But those accomplishments belong to them, yeah? What are you gonna do? And I, I tell the people, what kind of ancestor are you gonna be when they talk about you? You good guy or you sketchy guy, yeah? You help your neighbor or are you a thief, yeah? What kind of person they're gonna talk about you? And so that's, that's all I try to do, not only to my children, but whoever wants to listen. Like I was sharing the other day, uh, past two days I talked to over 
300 seventh graders up at Kamehameha Schools on a, um, on a Zoom to help instill in them. They're very fortunate to be attending that private school, by the way. Some of them, yeah, they take that for granted. But also, they have a responsibility or kuleana about, you know, living uh, aloha. Because wherever they go, you tell somebody you're from Hawaii, that'll bring a smile to their face. Now, you go place, you tell them you're American. Some, some places, people hate America, yeah? And rightfully so, yeah? Got a bunch of stuff that happened. But when you say Hawaii, different, yeah? I saw that on the reservations when I was there, up with the Lakota people, you know? They thought I was some Blackfoot, just like Tongans and Samoans. They don't get along, yeah? But they look at me, what tribe are you from, man? I said, guess. No, 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 no. I'm Hawaiian. I'm from Hawaii. Oh, you know. So there's that, that bond with us indigenous people. Thank you. Didn't mean to take that. But I got to say one more thing. I think Solomon is Portuguese. I'm Portuguese. I don't know about Hanale Portuguese, but in Hawaii, if you're Portuguese, yeah, you, you, you get diarrhea out of mouth sometimes. So sorry about that. It's okay. It's a great thing. You have beautiful things to say. So you're, this is your stage. You're welcome to it. <laughs> now let's go ahead with Solomon. Um, so same question to you in regards to serving your purpose and what you think your purpose is within the Hawaiian community and culture with what you do. Yeah, I, absolutely. So um, if I can uh, simply um, continue to uh, take the water that Brooke began to flow. I'm going to just take that water and move that into my into my garden. And then that water will then travel into Hanalei's garden right after. So just like our agrarian systems, the wisdom and the knowledge and the words that we're talking about, it this is a continuity. This is, you know, this conversation that Hanalei and Brooke and I have are things that we're always having whenever we get a chance to talk story. Um, well, we, we, we are descendants of people who... Um, when you talk to the other people of the Pacific, they always say, you know, the, the, the Maori, the, the Tongans, the Samoans, they say the, to the Hawaiians, the Hawaiians are the romantics. Yeah, we're the ones that are always like, hmm, <laughs> hmm, what's, I know that, I, I mean, this is cool, but I think there's something over there. Let, let's go look over there. And then once we get there, we're like, wow, yeah, hmm. Wait, over there, over there, there's something over there, something over there. And I think it's that wanderlust that defines us, what drove us on to keep searching, to moving beyond where we are right now. And um, uh, what I feel, just like my ancestors knew, they knew because of the birds. They knew because the macro organism, like little centipedes living on the surface of the ocean. They knew because of the tides. They knew because of the winds. They had all these different points of data that told them there's something beyond where we are right now. There are islands over there. Nobody else is going to believe us, but we know there's islands. And we knew it's, we were so confident that we knew these islands existed. We put our, all of our families onto our canoe and we risked our lives and we unlocked these new islands, right? And, and as, as we would said, these islands gave birth to us. And I think that we, you know, we became these islands. And so I sincerely feel as a native Hawaiian from that DNA, in, in that line, there is an exponentially better world than the one that we're currently living in. I can smell it. Yeah, it's delicious. It's a world where everyone has enough love. Everybody has enough water. Everyone has enough truth. Everyone has enough security. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, in order to get there, um, as an artist myself, and I, uh, I'm trying to take little pieces of what I understand from Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian mythology, Hawaiian stories, and um, I'm trying to uh, reinvigorate these stories. You know, basically, well, there's, there's many good things that can come out of it. So taking Hawaiian mythology and turning them into animation, turning them into augmented reality, walking through downtown Honolulu and having, you know, actual, you know, giant mo'o like lizard creatures like walking down the street. Oh, by the way, this part of the street or this part of the, our valley is named after that lizard, that water lizard is um, is a protector of the water, of the fresh water source. And if you don't know the name of that water lizard, of that mo'o, 
what is what we call our mobile, then we're not managing our fresh water source. And I think it's all of these different kinds of layers of, of stories that I, I'm really excited about bringing out into the mainstream. Um, and where all of this is going is ultimately to try to think about ways of um, acknowledging all indigenous knowledge and all indigenous wisdom globally, but to help encourage those stories to be told in such a way that is delicious, right? I mean, I, I think um, uh, Hollywood does an amazing job at telling stories, um, but the things that they've, they've run out of things to tell them. <laughs> so what happens is that they retell the same things over and over. Um, and yet there's these huge swaths of native peoples all around the world who've got amazing stories to tell, um, but they don't have the platform to tell it yet. And so uh, coming right back to where I am, um, in Hawaiian, we have our canoe culture. It's sailing around the world. It's like our, you know, we have that that organ within our within the cultural body. That organ is okay. That organ is getting out of, you know, it, um, it's it's beginning to thrive again. Our our taro culture, you know, our food, you know, we we are we we're, you know we're seeing this emergence. Uh, our language, you know, Hawaiian language is one of the few languages that are research, you know, they're going through this renaissance. You know, our hula traditions, fabulous. You know, so all the work that Marcus, you know, and, and um, Brooke folks are doing are a reflection of all these amazing new growths. The area, the next area that I think has been underdeveloped and is yet to be developed is our mo'olelo, our stories. And of all the things I just mentioned, the tarot, the hula dancer, the, um, you know, the, the spoken word, those are all actors and actresses, right? The stage are the stories. And I think we're, our stage is a little bit wobbly, but we're setting that stage. And so that's our mo'olelo traditions and our pa'ani traditions, our games. When I'm working with, with kids, with students, I'm talking story with them and they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh yeah, 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 sure, sure. I'm like, oh, what are you doing? Let's, let me, this is the hole in our net. And if we can fix this hole, in other words, if we can make games that reflect Hawaiian culture, indigenous value systems, you know, give a vehicle for you know, Lakota people to be able to translate why their land and their resources are so important, then that gives them another vehicle for them to tell their stories. And so what I'm hoping to do that Hawaii, Hawaii is kind of the perfect sandbox, right? We can try out these different sort of ideas in Hawaii and, you know, if they, they catch on then it's great. And I think it has application. Um, and one last thing, everybody is indigenous to somewhere. Everybody is a native person to some way. Yeah, we're all here because of our, an our ancestors had a tremendous amount of love for who we are. And to tap to what Brooke was saying earlier and, and Hanalei were, what we're talking about, I, I really want to ask people like, because um, we are our future ancestors, right? So how much do we love our great, 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 great grandchildren, right? How far does our love project into space and time? And I think, the more we can expand it, the, the more it means to be human, maybe. <laughs> Beautifully said. Now I'll leave it to Hanalei to uh, tell your, your vision and your perspective of how you think that you serve your people purposely. Yeah, mahalo. Uh, I, I just want to maybe just jump on to Solomon's imagery of the flowing water from one one tarot patch to the other. Um, it you know the water descends from from the heavens. Yeah, so it is it is that it's that sustainable you know, the the source of life. So it provides that for us. But when it goes through one tarot patch, it 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 gains so much. It gains nutrients. It gains all of this energy from that being in that space. And in, in the Hawaiian um, system, it's uh, it's agricultural system. It's a sustainable system, so the water is is um, taken into the taro patch and returned back to the river, and all of that nutrients that it gained from within that space is returned to the river and goes to the next taro patch, which gains more and more energy and more nutrients from every successive um, exposure to different spaces until it ends down at the ocean, where where um, we usually would create fish ponds, which would which would collect all of that concentrated energy to grow fish for the for the community to, to provide all of the forms of sustenance for for our people. And once we have all of those forms of of sustenance and security, 
we're able to do all of the things we would want to do, you know, to learn about the stars, learn about carving, learn to, to, um, um, to strengthen and um, um, uh, strengthen our different uh, visual arts practices or uh, different um, forms of, like Solomon said, mo'olelo, our storytelling, how we convey all of those things is all secured because we have that um, we have that food resource and we don't have to worry about it in that form. So I think for me, um, like Brooke mentioned, I, I do currently work at, at the Bishop Museum here in Honolulu. I, I do consider myself a caretaker of the things um, um, housed at the, at the Bishop Museum. But I also, like I mentioned, I, I also feel a responsibility for, for being the, the culture bearer for my ohana for those people that wish to learn from me, um, any, anyone that has that, that inkling or desire, um, that is my responsibility to make sure those things and practices are preserved in a way that future generations have access to it. Um, and, you know, for, for me, what I've learned from, from things in the museum, the, the physical, the, the manifestations of our ancestors in, in the museum, I look at them as ancestors as well. They, they are ancestors that don't have a, a physical voice to speak and tell me what they know, but they have shared so much with me and, and the knowledge that they retain um, has been so invaluable that that's something I wanna make sure that future generations understand. And when, when we start thinking about all of those varying forms, because you know, my my ancestors, my elders, all of those people that I'm I've been able to connect with over, um, over the over my time here on this planet, and and all of those inanimate ancestors that I've been able to communicate with too, um, it really does tell me the idea. Uh, it it shares with me um, the concept of 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 creativity and inspiration. Um, those are the, the building blocks of every community. Um, when we think about all of those, what we consider traditional um, in, any, in, any, um, in any culture, what we consider traditional today was a, was a creative inspira um, inspiration, um, innovative practice to them. You know, they were creating something new. They were experiencing their world at that time and imbuing those concepts, those, those um, creative processes that they were doing at that time into their work. And now we consider that tr a tradition. So what we, what we create today, like Solomon and like Brooke was saying, what we create today will be the traditions of our, our, our future generations. Um, so it is that connection, that continuum, that, co that story that, that links us all together. And if we can maintain that, that connection, that, that mo'olelo, that's, I think that is the true essence of a living culture and the connection to our ancestors and the creative um, authority that was given to us by them. That's amazing. You, you know, like this is, um, I, I started off in, in my visit to American Samoa, then I went off to Guam and now we're in Hawaii. And there seems to be a pattern of a living culture. I keep hearing those words. And it's, it just really speaks really close to home because truly, I think you all speak such beautiful truth in regards to embracing who you are, where you come from. And it almost makes me feel as though you, you're all conduits of your, your, uh, your family, your, your ancestry. So it's, it's beautiful. And now uh, I kind of want to pivot it. And I'm curious to know like how, how the new generation actually is, is taking in all of the influences of, of our, our global society, really, because now with the direct access to internet, to um, social media, there's, there's a network outside of, of our own, like your island, for example. So, um, and then I also remember speaking to you, Hanale, and you mentioned like, there, there's a sense of a renaissance as well of bringing back um, the, the true roots that came from the indigenous people of Hawaii. Um, so I'll start off with you, Hanalei. 
Oh yes, thank you. So there was a there was a disconnect on a number of generations. You know, um, my parents, grandparents, our, our grandparents' generation um, did have a disconnect to the culture, to the land. You know, the and the stories um, because of the Western influence, um, the and and the consequences that some of them had to face if they if they lived or practiced um, some of the things that they did. So that suppression of culture and 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 um, prohibition of of speaking your language actually was huge for for that particular generation and it was uh, uh, very fortunate that in the you know the late 1970s there was this whole resurgence of uh, and pride within the culture for the, for the culture of hawaii in language in all the visual art practices um, um, and other other forms so um, i think we we are a very lucky um, community in a sense that we still have so many resources available to us that have been recorded in various forms in Hawaiian language newspapers, a million papers, a million pages of Hawaiian language written in Hawaiian language um, newspapers with stories and you know information that was that was being um, preserved in those in those newspaper pages. For future generations to to access and, and um, connect with, uh, and then we have again we have those few examples of the living tradition being passed on through through family lines and different generations that really connect um, connect us to that living aspect, yeah, and, and perpetuation and, and from generation to generation. So to have that combination between the two um, is a is a huge thing I think for our generations today because now we have a have generations that have completely grown up with with all of that at their disposal. You know, have have grandparents, have parents that speak Hawaiian um, that can share the stories of the culture and and actually have access to land going into the going into the taro patches or creating fish ponds or you know those different forms that really spoke to the culture and the connection to space and value systems of Hawaii. So I think um, it's it's quite a um, inspiring time for me, especially for the, the young generation. Um, we know that every generation makes um, makes it what uh, makes themselves who they are. Um, and I think our hope is that you know we are able to provide at least um, this opportunity to re-engage in these varying forms, which so many other you know my parents and um, grandparents' generation never really had that opportunity. So providing that opportunity again, um, I think is is the greatest um, hope for me, and and inspires me to to just keep on sharing with what I with what I'm able to, um, and. And you know, we can never we can never um, um, really know what the next generation will do with what what we share with them. But it is our hope that you know, if if we can provide this strong connection to space and and values and family, um, that they they perpetuate it in in whatever way they feel is most appropriate and relevant to them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Brooke, do you want to go ahead and piggyback off that? Well, uh, just to follow up what Hannah Lee beautifully shared, I, I work with a lot of um, young uh, opio. We call them opio, sort of the little puas. Um, I don't know if there's a Hawaiian word for rug rat, but these little kids. And um, because of COVID 2020, it sucks to be them, sucks. 2020 class couldn't graduate. They had to do so many things, but you know, I share with them when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade, okay? They're gonna become stronger because of this. This generation has a lot of distractions, yeah? Uh, instant gratification, the blue light special. They like them now, they don't like work. You guys owe me that, yeah? I, but Take, be able to teach them discipline um, through stories of the kupuna. You know, nothing came easy. Nobody gonna give you on free lunch. You know what I mean? You gotta work. You gotta work hard and you gotta do. I taught them about their passion or their talents to identify it, to improve it and to share with others because that's aloha in itself. And along the way, like yesterday, I talked to some of the um, 
those kids, I said, you're going to have people that give you constructive criticism and people that like to throw mud. For example, I get guys coming in my booth and ask me, how you feel making money off the ancestors, bro? It's like, wow. I saw him coming. I saw his dark clouds coming in my booth, you know, and the rain and the thunder. And this guy, he's, he's a negative Hawaiian. Yeah. It could be any nationality, but it's usually Hawaiian. So I just tell him, bro, you know, if I had a grandson taking care of my grandchildren by painting my pictures and keeping my name and memory alive, I'd be happy, bro. And why not me? Yeah. That's my family. I love them. I know they still love me. Yeah. Why not me? Through my point of view, through my heart, my love comes to, down to my hand, to the brush, to the paint on the canvas. That's how I take care of my family. Unfortunately, I got to pay rent, food, clothing, bro. Yeah, it costs money, right? This is how I take care of my family. It's all up with love. I'm not taking advantage. Yeah. What do you do to take care of your family? Have a nice day. Bye. So you have all that kind of things to think about, but with the youth nowadays, um, like my daughter, for example, she's trying to get into law school. She's at BYU right now. She wants to come home and help her people. Yeah. In some of the struggles they're doing indigenous areas. She's, she's focusing on now. Okay. Because of the colonialism, wherever you go. Yeah. Try to wipe you. Nah, you know what you guys been doing for a thousand years. That's not good. You got to do them how, like I say now. Yeah. The language, no good. American Indians had the same thing, all that, wherever you go, yeah? But we have our own identity, always did. I was lucky I grew up in a house. In the early 60s, like this guy was telling me, you Hawaiian, oh, you must be fat, stupid, and lazy, huh? Come down early 1970s, Hawaiian Renaissance, the boys talked about that. Hokulea was born, the voyaging canoe, the hula halaus, the language, the arts, Rocky Jensen then made Halinawa. Yeah, Joe Momoa, Jason's dad was in that. Herb Kane, yeah. Um, Duncan Sito, yeah. Al Lagrino, all these, all these guys, they, they know who they are, yeah. But all these people that help visually with their talents. But like Hanale said, and Solomon said, a lot of these kids, they get plenty of different talents. Yeah, plenty. Not only visual, musical, but Akamai, smart, they can... Maybe if some of them was a little older, they figure out how to solve this dang COVID already. That's how smart the kids are. Yeah? So never underestimate the youth. You know, no, I, I don't. Thank you. Thank you. And Solomon, you have found a way too to um, sort of translate your, your artwork to be modern bring in the elements of maybe anime correct me if i'm wrong and that's sort of a uh, way to fuse it so that it, it's relevant still with the younger people if you would like to continue on this waterfall absolutely yeah you know so right in line with um the book in Hanalai we, we're talking about so we're actually witnessing an ecosystem here we're seeing evaporation transportation it rains now so this whole discussion is going Perfect with my screen screen background, um, and so the um, you know uh, I just see this idea of our youth under what they what they know how to do is what has made our ancestors so successful up to this point is again we learn how to take our deficiencies and turn them to our assets. Yeah, what is what are we lacking? How can we turn that around into something that we actually have? Yeah, and so. Um, I like to look at you know our historic you know our, our stories our mythology within our mythology are these tools that allow us to understand what it means to be human because so, what we're actually trying to do we're trying to survive ourselves as a species yeah as individuals we, we have to survive being an individual <laughs> and as a species we have to just survive being human humans we are the we are our last conundrum we are the final conundrum is ourselves you know we are the problem and we're the solution. It's like, oh no, and oh yes, at the same time, which is, you know. Um, so when I look back within Hawaiian culture, I reflect on the story of um, uh, Pele falls asleep. Pele is our, our um, volcano goddess, our magma goddess, our fire goddess. And there's so many ways to express who she is, but to, to feel her heat is to know her, right? And in this story, she falls asleep 
And as she's sleeping, one of her sisters, Hiyaka, Hiyaka, Hiyaka um, um, sits over Pele and she, you know, um, just guides her in, in her sleep. And as Pele is sleeping, Pele uh, travels to Kauai in, in, in a dream form. And in Kauai, she manifests herself. So she goes from Hawaii Island all the way across the archipelago to Kauai, to the other side of Hawaiian archipelago. And she appears in front of um, lo, um, uh, Lohiau. Lohiau is one of the most handsome men in Hawaii at the time. And she appears there and, and Lohiau and all of his friends say, whoa, look at Pele, wow. And the whole, and there's this great epic. It's kind of like our own Lord of the Rings. It's all about, um, Pele wakes up and says, um, Hiaka, sister, go to Kauai and bring that man back to me. Okay, and that sets up this huge, amazing story. But Pele was using Zoom, you see? So Pele was doing exactly what we're doing right now. And so when I think about these stories and how relevant they are when you talk about ways of human beings communicating with each other, you know, being able to connect with each other. Um, I, another archetype, well, a, a archetype that I would like to explore, you know, real briefly also is our, our shapeshifters. Being able to transform from one state into another state. We have uh, one of our more naughtier kind of uh, um, our demigods is Kamapua'a, so the man who is a boar, a man who is a pig. Oh, wait, maybe that's the same thing. <laughs> no, so he, he gets chased by Pele. Here's Pele again, and he's, he got into trouble with Pele. Okay, Pele is chasing after him, and she's throwing these fireballs at him. And Kamapua's running, running away, and he comes down to the ocean, and he transforms. He transforms from a man, and he could turn into a pig. He could turn into all these different things. But he transforms into uh, the humu humu nuku nuku apua'a, which is a fish that looks like a pig. The fish with a pig-like nose, right? And he jumps into the water and he turns into the into the fish. And then when he comes back onto the shore, he transforms back into a man again. And we as a, we as Hawaiians, we've had to shape shift. We have to be Hawaiian, and we have to be American, you know, and we have to be global citizens, you know. And I think those, being able to move between these different forms is a reminder that as human beings, I mean, we are, we are so adaptable. We are highly adaptable. We're adept at adaptation. And um, as a species, just like crawling out of the ocean in the first place, how, how like, you know, paradigm, how much of a paradigm shift that was, um, our youth are now, have the opportunity to crawl out of the next ocean. There's a whole nother reality that's as different from fish is, you know, the ocean was to land, it's now land to something else. And we're on the cusp of something else. And to quote a little bit of Stanley Kubrick, something wonderful. <laughs> that was truly something wonderful. <laughs> um, I'm just going to share with you, with everyone briefly, um, some of the works that uh, I, Hannah Lay has done, and then we'll move into some of Solomon's work. And I believe Brooke has a presentation for us to, to end the conversation. So, as we know, Hannah Lay does these beautiful fiber works, and I'll let you take it away from here. Sure, thank you. So, um, you know, I've always had a passion to to try and preserve the the stories and and practices of uh, from our from our our ancestors and kupuna. Um, so these this is a traditional Hawaiian fan um, that incorporates different kinds of techniques, um, cordage, um, uh, different plating techniques for the blade itself, um, but there really hasn't been anyone um, that has perpetuated this particular style. So, you know, I've always had a passion to try and reawaken some of these sleeping practices that, that are found in, in mostly in museum collections around the world. So, uh, so this is something that I was able to, to create after an experience going to the British Museum and seeing some of the other fans that exist in that, in the collection there from Hawaii. And and this is my um, this is what what came out of that experience. You know, my my creative juices just started to flow after that moment, and I created this fan and actually gifted it back to the British Museum so that there's a, a dialogue 
uh, with it from the, the things that they care for from the past, but also uh, how it speaks to us today and how that will continue on into the future. So that was, uh, that's this, uh, this particular fan. And then I have a, a couple of other images um, of an art installation that I created back in 2017 for the Honolulu Biennial. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an art installation that has three dimensional pieces here. Um, if you see the, on the four platforms, it has the two dimensional the banners on the wall, um, but also the, the next image has, um, has the third component of the, of the piece, which was a, the living, moving aspect of the, of the work itself. Um, so bringing together the two-dimensional space, the three-dimensional space, and then the thing that brings it all to life, the people, that, that energy of ourselves and the community and how that all connects us all together. So this was an, it, this was an homage to our uh, pantheon of Hawaiian ancestors and deities and protectors um, and the various forms and, and um, as, as Solomon was mentioning, the manifestations that our, our ancestors took, the varying animal forms, plant forms, um, colors that represented them, and how all of those spoke together, and how they really worked together to create that, that ecosystem of sustainable practice and life. So, yeah. Excellent. Now, I have some questions here. Um, so I'm noticing that there's a lot of this sort of net looking, uh, but it's been incorporated as, as something that you wear. Has, is that something that's been traditionally done that way or is this just like a, a modern? Uh, so of? yeah, so there's a traditional uh, practice of using cordage in, the, in, um, in garments. Uh, in Mo'olelo, there, there are many stories that speak to our, um, our our gods and goddesses and ancestors using using cordage in uh, in in clothing form. Uh, there's no physical example of those because those were so so special and so sacred. Those were oftentimes um, taken with those ancestors when they passed away and passed on uh, from this space to the next space. Um, so there were no physical examples that exist, um, but we have that story. We have those stories, and I think this is. This is where I, uh, I drew upon those stories and knowing the techniques that I know of brought those things um, and brought those things together. Um, and again, speaking to the same continuum of, of practice and mo'olelo um, and how it's in interpreted from one generation to the next. Now I have some of Solomon's work. Okay, so um, I'm going to go real quickly because I want to make enough, make sure we have enough time for Brooke's Mana'o because um, Brooke and, and Hanale, or Brooke and Hanale, <laughs> Brooke, and, Brooke and Hanale guys have been so kind to leave the, to, to let, op, leave the way open into their gardens and I go into their gardens and I harvest cuttings from their, from their plants and their trees all the time and Sometimes late at night when they're sleeping, I'm harvesting by the moonlight some of little pieces, just just little little cuttings from their ideas, and it's wonderful because what I'm what you're seeing is a fusion between the you know the figurative work that Brooke has been doing, you know that the the forms, the human forms, the vessels, and the um the, some of the aesthetic and the weave work of Hanale, you know. So this image you see here is a mo'o. It's an expression of our mo'o wahine, our lizard goddesses, our, our water spirits. And there were hundreds, there are hundreds of them. And they take on all these different forms. This is also a, a brief a homage and aesthetically. It's my love for the work of uh, René Lalou, uh, Fantastic Planet, or uh, Les Planètes Sauvages, uh, which is this um, so that was a 1973 animation all about the Czechoslovakian uh, spring when Russia basically, for a brief period of time when there was democracy in Czechoslovakia, and they made an animation about it. So it was like a protest animation for those who, who know that cult, super cult classic animation. Anyway, uh, next image, please. <laughs> And this is another mo'o done in another style. This is, this is my love for like a Hayao Miyazaki. Um, and uh, it's got a, it's a giant mo'o and it's got all the 
entire forest that goes right along its back. And I could, again, talk forever about this image. And so uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next. But I love to try out different styles. And this is just if I was making animation based in Hawaii. And this is an image of Kamapua'a, the boar god, the boar man that I was talking about earlier. He could transform into this giant eight-eyed boar. And here's, here he is chasing down uh, Olopana's army. Um, but basically, it's almost as if I'm peering into another world where someone has already made animations of our stories, or we've made animations of our own stories. So these are like faux animations that I'm, I'm just putting that out there just to have fun. So, okay, next image, please. Uh, and then a, a, a zoom in to the work that's behind me. So this is, um, actually, the name of this piece is And it, it's, just a, it's just a little fun nod to my... my um, love for da Dadaism because we need we need neo Dada. Yeah, we need we need to be able to shout back incoherently and make all kinds of noise to drown out all the ridiculous noise that's happening right now. You know, we need we need, we need something even more ridiculous to make the ridiculous, you know, give some context to the, ri the ridiculousness that we already have. Anyway, um, and then the last the last image is um, again returning back to this I, uh, I I do a series of pieces called this cryptic utopias. These are visions in the far future in a time after war, after suffering, after injustice. You know, at, you know, basically, we need visions of what we want. And if we have 31 flavors of dystopia coming out in the movie theaters, coming out, you know, manifesting in the games that you play, then that's what we're going to get. But if we, you know, continue to come, come up with all these different visions of hopeful futures, of how we're going to solve our problems, of how, how we're going to be able to get to that world where we're everybody's winning, everyone and everything is winning. Um, and I think uh, one, one image at a time, I'm paddling a little closer to that kind of reality. And I think um, uh, it's an extension of my, of my DNA as a, as, a, as a wonderlust, as a product of wonderlust. <laughs> I'm done. We can probably end it right here, you know. I'd rather listen to these guys, Solomon and uh, Hanale. Bro, you guys inspire me. I like I like paint right now. I I like jump on some paintings already. You guys, I'm just sort of kind, amped. It's like I stuck my finger in the electric uh, outlet, bro. I'm like whoa, so heavy the way they s interpret and just share. Yeah, man, look, I ain't kidding. Look, I get we call a chicken skin and Hawaiian. I just amazing amazing but thank you i love you guys I always love your work continue to do what you do and inspire not only me but everybody yeah so really quickly guys i know the time is gone already but uh we'll go ahead and uh just share maybe because of time yeah um maybe just one story right now we can go uh, a little I'm, over past it's okay you sure we okay yeah. okay okay Okay, from start, and then let me uh, go ahead and share the screen. Where are you? I'm share. Okay, here we go. Okay. You guys can see this. You guys can see. Okay, here we go. Uh, buckle your seatbelts. Here we go, gang. Like we were talking about, I'm going to sh share some stuff that happens to me in the booth. It's pretty neat, um, I think. And it's just a manifestation of how much I kupuna love us. Like I said, this is my gang. I'm an empty nester now. I'm learning how to be an, uh, a parent to adults. Yeah. These college graduate kids, they have to um, decipher words they throw at me now. I'm like, bro, what is that? Just talk English. You know what I mean? But you know, we love our kids and we did the best to raise them. I grew up in an environment where my dad was a heavy um, equipment operator. But he painted, that was his hobby, and he loved to read. And so I grew up in that environment, very, very fortunate. We talked about the Hawaiian Renaissance. This is the group of the Hawaiian artists. This is one of the first uh, uh, groups, other than King Kalakaua, when he was a king, he started one up too, because when he was king, it was cool to be Hawaiian again, yeah? But some of these people that were in here, um, like I shared, Joe Momoa, Jason's dad, heavy Hawaiian artist, uh, Duncan Sito, Al Laguerno, Rocky Jensen, Lucia Jensen, and uh, this gentleman, uh, Mr. Herb Connie, icon. His images will live forever. He was kind enough to um, spend some time with me at his house, and he was tutoring me when I first started painting about 10 years ago. I would email my stuff to him, and he'd help me. 
but uh, Google his name when you guys get a chance. See some of his incredible, incredible work. This is some of my dad's stuff I grew up with. This little fireball over here, that's black magic Hawaiian stuff. All indigenous people have it, yeah? But all this kind of subjects. So I, as a little kid, I drew too. That's how I practiced because that was my happy place. I loved Hawaiian stuff even at an early age, fourth grade, fifth grade. I was already in, into it. Bought a lot of Conan comics. I love uh, to draw anatomy and I'm a guy. I get plenty of guys that paint fish, birds, mountains, and that's good. I love those guys. But if you need warrior stuff, I'm your guy. It's in my DNA. I'm sorry. It's just part of my um, DNA and fiber. Started painting all the chiefs. This is some of uh, the different island groups. And they all got their own stories, yeah? They all got their own heroes. And the neck that turns the head, happy wife, happy life. I teach the kids all the time, you better start now respecting your sister, yeah? And stop being a pain to her and, you know, love your mom and be respectful because don't learn the hard way. But we're going to talk about Oahu really quickly, why this was a, a, such a special place and a story and a painting I did on that. Talking about Kahikili of Maui and Kahahana. He raised this little boy when he was a baby, Oahu King. He raised the boy on Maui. The Oahu King was acting up. They replaced him. He put his nephew in. He said, brah, uncle gonna miss you. All you gotta do is give me Kualoa. That I don't want the whole island, um, nephew. I just want that little slot. Told him, uncle, no worry. You can have him. Except when he comes back to Oahu and tells his kahuna nui or his head, uh, medicine man he tells him bro you can't give him that that's the strength that holds up oahu and why is kuloa so special this is a aerial shot of how it looks like today it's because for centuries this is where the whales came to die just like tazan movie the elephants go someplace yeah in hawaii in the archipelago this and the bottom of the picture is a recent picture in kaneohe okay so it's still happening today and the Hawaiians used to harvest the teeth or the ivory, a representation of Kanaloa, or the one, uh, one of the uh, deities that, that cruises the depths of the sea. And there's a lot of things we can talk about. Hanale and Solomon is more expert at all of that stuff, but that's why they wanted Oahu for the ivory. This is my great grandma's halawa that we had in the family. Grandfather, my grandfather donated it to Hanale them at the museum in 1961 because everybody was fighting over it. When he was gonna die, that's gonna be mine. And so I got to go see it, touch it, smell it. Um, very spiritual experience for me because that's my ancestors here over there. As you see, I don't have any hair anymore. That's from my oldest son that used to lie to me, yeah? So it all committed suicide, but this is my ancestors here, over here, okay? And I also carve also, just to feel close to them. But what happens when Kahikili finds out he cannot have it, his kohono nui is Kaleo Pulu Pulu. Kao Pulu Pulu's little brother, they don't get along. He starts passing um, gossip. He said, Kahikili, you gotta watch your kahuna, he like take over. Kahana believes the lies and he kills his kahuna and the son while the son commits suicide off of Wainai. But they curse Kahahana and they tell him, you know what? You'll never have increase. The Oahu lines will come to an end. When Kahikili hears that, he's on Zoom too. He sends on a 600 uh, exploratory, um, his Navy SEALs on about 12 canoes and they come and they poke around in Waikiki saying, oh, you know, left jab, left jab, right, right, right. Just to see how these guys are gonna take it. Oahu chiefs get together. They say, no, we're not strong enough. The next morning, eight, of the generals do a commando raid on the 600 at the beaches of Waikiki. These guys, these Maui guys think it's a joke. It's a hoax. There's 600 of us, only eight of you, but these guys were all expert Lua men. Decimated the Maui forces. They never saw the movie 300. They never heard of Sparta, but we have our own stories, yeah? They lived to fight another day when Kahikili was full strength. They did really good, except when they killed his favorite General, Kahikili committed genocide. Men, women, children, your pet dog, cat, goldfish, all burned, dead. If you were lucky enough to escape Oahu 
and go to another island and you better change your last name too because they're gonna send guys out to hunt. I completed this painting in 2014. I had it hanging in my booth. This is the booth I had. This lady, I know Hannah Land, Solomon knows she is a Hawaiian icon, a wonderful, sweet uh, kumuhula. Her daughters are carrying over today. She stops in my booth and she looks in my booth and it's just like this. She goes, oh, I see your booth is really full today. She what you mean, auntie? She goes, you're the venue to tell their stories. You bring them to life. They will take care of you. Mahalo for your work. On the last day of the event, early in the morning, a gentleman walks in before everybody else. Now, this is the Hawaiian convention at the convention center. You got Kanakas from Kauai to Kau. They're all over there. Thousands, thousands. Last day, guy walks in, points to the middle. Guy in the middle, he says, that's Popuka, eh, bro. And I'm shocked because Maui won the war. They don't want you to know this story. They bury it in the history books. You got to dig for find this story. And I said, brother, you come to my booth and you come in and you say, that's Popuka. How the heck did you know that? He says, that's my name. That's my tutu, man. I go, wow. He goes, bro, you the artist. I go, yeah. He says, I saw you putting up the painting the first day. He said, I was talking to my tutu man. I said, what? What you talking about, bro? He said, they were all here to look at your painting. I go, and he said, they loved it, bro. Somebody's telling their story. Yeah. Why did you paint that? He said, you know who Pupuka was? I said, no, not really, bro. He said, he was one of Kahahana's sons. And it was his idea to do the commando raid. He said, why did you paint that? I said, well, my baby girl got into Punahou, watching the boys play football with the O on the helmet. They said that they were the sons of Oahu. I said, nah, this is the story of the sons of Oahu. This is the original, guys. And so I painted this. In conclusion, I share I get a lot of help. This is the first time it happened to me. I painted this just when I first started, 20, uh, 2009. This is Alapai. He's the type of guy, if that's your uncle and you're going to a family, if you're going to Thanksgiving at his house, you better behave. Because if you don't, you're going to get lickings. He's not going to ask your parents if he can lick you. He's just going to give you a behavior, uh, you know, adjustment. That's the kind of guy he was. He was like, hit first, ask questions later. So I made him kind of look like, you know what, you're bothering me. Had it in my booth. Guy walks in, tells me his last name is Alapai. That's his Tutu man and his great grandfather looks just like my painting. I go, wow, bro. Thank you. I don't know, man. That's how he came out. This is the blind chief from Kau, Imai Kalani. Fascinating story in ruling chiefs. He trained ducks because he was blind to spot as battle drones in battle. Hawaiians were the first in the world to use battle drones. Yeah. He trained the ducks. Quack, 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 boss. He's on your left side. Boom, boom, boom. He could throw five spears at one time. They love him today in Kau. He lived in the 1400s, okay? Painted that painting, 2014, 2016, and got a call from a lady in Waianae, Jana Raposa. Bruh, you made this painting. That's my tutu man. Can I get a print? She comes, picks it up. A week later, she faxes me, texts me this, a picture of her great-grandfather, Daniel I Imai Kalani from Kauai, 1912. How in the world do you know that's how we look like? She said, sister, I take no credit. I saw these guys come out. This one just happened last month. This is the guy that saved Kamehameha from certain death because the king, Alapai, that we just saw, wanted him, heard about a legend of a, a chief that would rule all the lands. He didn't want that. He sent out a death decree just like a, um, when Jesus was born almost, yeah? So this guy came and he rescued that baby and Kamehameha did you know, what he did. Put that out. A week later, a lady from Molokai sends me this picture. This is my tutu man. How you know that's how we look like? It's amazing. I share our art, our culture. This is all in Waikiki, different hotels throughout the state. Hawaiian point of view from Hawaiian hearts, yeah? So like I, like I mentioned before, you know, in this picture, I'm a son, grandson, great-grandfather, but I also, I also always lead by asking the audience, what kind of ancestor are you going to be? What are they going to talk about you? Yeah. What have you learned? Now, some of that stuff that happened in the past, I leave in the past. 
because it's not all ice cream and candy. It's not. I don't judge my ancestors. I love them. I concentrate on the positive and I learn from the negative. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you so much, every single one of you. I, I feel so honored and privileged to have been able to sit here uh, and ask you the questions that I've been able to ask. And I feel like th the biggest takeaways have been, uh, first, uh, what is the script that it is that we're writing? Um, how, what kind of ancestor are we going to be? How are we gonna make the living culture of the new generations uh, true to to what we want to tell and how we want to write a better, better story for everyone else to come. Um, I that about wraps it up for me. Is there anything that you you all want to share? Maybe um, if you could share maybe where people can find your work, uh, your website, ways that people can contact you if they're interested in any of your works. Go ahead. I just wanted to say it was my honor and privilege to be in the presence of, of you, Estefania, and thank you for um, getting this together. But uh, deep aloha for Solomon and Marcus. What a wonderful surprise. I mean, it's like we just started a band. You can take the show on the road if you want, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, bro, these, you got the heavy hitters over here. Yeah, all these guys. It's yeah. really, really good. Maybe one wahini to get a wahini point of view so we don't get uh, persecuted for not having a female point of view. But... You get plenty of ladies out there too, but up to you. You can pick them, but uh, hawaiianatart.org uh, is where you can find my stuff. Yeah, that's all. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Love you guys. You guys take care now. Oh, uh, at, at Solomon Enos. That's it. I, 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 would, I could talk some more, but I want to hand it over to Hanalei. Thank you. Thank you all. And bless you for this opportunity to share. Mahalo. I, I echo everything that was shared already. Uh, it's just a great opportunity to, to share my, my own perspective and my, my passion and, and hopefully it was able to come through in this conversation. But yeah, um, I have a website, marcusmarzan.com and you can, can link up to me there. All right, so thank you all again. And uh, it's a privilege to be able to be here with you. Hopefully as our borders start to reopen, um, we can all have a beautiful dinner and outing in Hawaii one time. So I, I do hope that you stay in touch and um, please, I, I look forward to getting to know you better. Okay, have a good day, everyone. Thank Take you. care. Aloha, my brothers. You guys take care. Aloha. 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 Aloha.